Um, thanks, Mark. Um, I guess it's my job to introduce the panelists, and I will start uh, from uh, an individual who is to my far uh, right uh, uh, only by the fact that he's sitting there and, and in no other possible uh, way. Uh, Joel uh, uh, McNally uh, is uh, uh, somebody who uh, uh, those of us who have been around town for a while know very well. Uh, he is a columnist and uh, editor for the Milwaukee uh, Shepherd Express, uh, formerly a columnist for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, I might add. Uh, he also has a column... So two of those things are wrong. I, I'm not the editor of the Shepherd, and I never worked for the Journal Sentinel, but aside from that... Oh, that's pretty, right. It was the Milwaukee, it was the Milwaukee Journal yeah. back in those days. That's right. Um, you know, I've been programmed to say Journal Sentinel. Uh, the, um, uh, he is, uh, currently has a column in the Capital Times in Madison and is a co-host of a morning radio uh, show on WMCS and a regular contributor on two local television news shows. Uh, Mr. McNally also serves on the board of directors for the Milwaukee ACLU. Uh, Dr. Eric Ugland uh, is uh, an assistant professor at uh, the College of Communications here at uh, Marquette University where he focuses his research on media law and policy, uh, First Amendment theory, regulatory models and rationales, and media ethics and accountability. His numerous scholarly articles have appeared in both uh, law journals as uh, well as journals that focus on mass media and journalism. Professor Ugland has studied the Fairness Doctrine extensively and his article, The Fairness Doctrine Redux, Media Bias and the Rights of Broadcasters, was published by the Minnesota Journal of Law, Science, and Technology in 2005. He studied at the University of Minnesota, where he obtained his Bachelor of Arts degree, uh, his Juris Doctor, uh, Master's, and PhD. Uh, Charlie Sykes is host of uh, Midday with uh, Charlie uh, Sykes on WTMJ here in Milwaukee. Uh, Charlie is the author of uh, six books, including A Nation of Victims and Dumbing Down Our Kids, and uh, most recently, uh, 50 Things uh, That Your Kids Won't Learn in School. Um, and I can personally commend that book because I happen to be uh, quoted uh, in, in the book. Uh, one page, in a, what, 200-page book, one paragraph. I don't know what you've made in royalties, but I figure that you owe me at least a domestic light beer. Um, uh, Charlie uh, has a, also has, in addition to his radio duties, has a weekly television show, Sunday Insight with Charlie Sykes, on today's TMJ4, which airs Sundays at 10 a.m. He writes a weekly column for community newspapers and serves as the Wisconsin blogosphere champion, uh, also known as the blog father, uh, with his Sykes Writes uh, uh, blog. Uh, he, a Pulitzer nominee, Charlie has appeared on national television, broadcast from the White House, and spoken at major universities. Uh, last but not least, uh, Guy Benson is America's youngest top market political talk show host. His radio program is heard weekly on Chicago's AM radio uh, 560 WIND, <coughs> and on weekdays he serves as the executive producer of the Sandy Ria Show, an afternoon drive time political program airing on AM 1160 WILL in Chicago. Uh, Mr. Benson was an intern at the White House during the second term of President George W. Bush and an intern at the Fox News Channel in New York City. At Fox News, uh, he assisted with the show preparation, research, editing, and guest relations uh, for the primetime show Hannity and Combs and also contributed to the network's coverage of the 2004 Republican Convention. Mr. Benson was an on-air reporter at an NPR affiliate in South Florida in 2006 is an occasional contributor to National Review Online's blog Row, and his regular townhall.com column is accessed worldwide. He also appears regularly on the nationally syndicated Hugh Hewitt radio show. Mr. Benson graduated with honors from Northwestern University's Medell School of Journalism in 2006. I'd like to uh, welcome all of our panelists to Marquette University Law School, and thank you for uh, uh, agreeing to, uh, to share your time with our students. Uh, we're going to give each panelist about 10 minutes to uh, 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 begin uh, discussing uh, uh, issues raised uh, by the Fairness Doctrine, and uh, we, will, uh, we will start with Guy Benson, move to uh, Charlie Sykes, uh, Dr. England, and uh, then Joel McNally. Okay, well, uh, 
very nice to be here. I figured I might be the least persuasive person here, so I decided to at least wear the school colors and maybe garner some favor that way. Um, Mark was very helpful in sending an email to guide us with a couple questions that we'd be addressing. He, he addressed six questions, um, and I'm going to try to deal with four of them because two of them, including personal experience with the policy, I don't have any uh, because the Fairness Doctrine was out of existence when I was a toddler, uh, thank goodness. But he asked about legal questions, uh, societal impact of a reinstitution of the Fairness Doctrine, uh, some historical background, and then the area that I'm probably most familiar with, the prospects uh, for the reinstatement of the Fairness Doctrine under a potential Obama presidency. Um, starting with the constitutionality here, um, I'm not a law student. You guys are probably uh, more familiar with the details of the Constitution than I am, but the way I look at it is government bureaucrats monitoring programming and perhaps punishing political speech through fines or loss of license, all in the name of fairness as defined uh, by the government, sorry, as defined by the government, strikes me as at the very least perilous constitutional ground. Um, we've seen cases where the Supreme Court has defined in some way exotic dancing and child, uh, child pornography, virtual child pornography as freedom of expression. So if we're expanding the definition of what is protected by the First Amendment, I really can't imagine something more protected than political speech. Um, the big case was a 1969 case, Red Lion versus FCC, where the FCC upheld the Fairness Doctrine at that time, buying into the argument that the public airwaves are scarce. Um, I would argue that that's a pretty bad argument, especially these days, uh, but that was, their, that was their opinion. However, at the time when the Supreme Court issued that decision, they added a caveat that I just wanted to quote. Um, they said that one of the regulation's purposes, talking about the Fairness Doctrine, was to bring the public more controversial news and views on important issues. If the doctrine instead had the, quote, net effect of reducing rather than enhancing the volume and quality of coverage, and if it had a, quote, chilling effect on speech, they would rethink its constitutionality. And when it comes to societal impact, I would argue that society generally is harmed when constitutionally protected speech is suppressed at any level. This doctrine specifically politicizes free speech. The people who are mostly pushing it are liberal Democrats. Um, from Louise uh, Slaughter, she's a congresswoman from New York who has referred to conservative talk radio as a waste of the public airwaves and has even spoken about trying to expand the Fairness Doctrine to cable news programs, MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, and the like. Dianne Feinstein has criticized talk radio for being too explosive. That's part of her rationale for bringing back the Fairness Doctrine. Nancy Pelosi, one of her top aides, was quoted as saying that uh, conservative talk radio is a huge threat and an advantage for the Republican Party, so they're going to attempt to limit the threat. Uh, and then you've got uh, senators like John Kerry, Senator Bingaman just came out uh, a few months ago talking about how wonderful it would be to bring back the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, it's, it's a partisan attempt to shut down one side of the spectrum, uh, mostly the conservative side. Now, the other thing that's interesting, not all liberals, I just want a quick caveat, not all liberals are behind this. Uh, Lanny Davis, Dan Rather, Alan Combs have all spoken out against it. The Los Angeles Times editorial board and the Washington Post editorial board have editorialized very strongly against it. The LA Times had a great editorial, I think it was last year on this. Uh, so it's, it's, not a, it's a, not a directly partisan issue. But the idea behind it is conservatives dominate talk radio. Uh, you look at the biggest names in talk radio, they are almost all conservative. Liberalism has not translated that well, by and large, uh, on talk radio. Air America has had all kinds of financial problems. They just don't really compete in the marketplace uh, consistently in almost any market. So to impose the fairness doctrine, which is to say there has to be equal time for both sides, which somehow I think preposterously, preposterously assumes that there are only two sides to any issue, but both sides have to be represented. Um, for example, if my station, if the Fairness Doctrine came back, my station would have to say, all right, for every two hours of Guy Benson's show, we have to